Shalom, friends. My name is Mitch Glazer, and I'm the president of Chosen People Ministries. And on behalf of our global family, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Hanukkah. For many of my fellow Jewish people, the idea of actually linking these two holidays together is awkward. Honestly, it still feels a little strange to me after being a follower of Jesus for the last 52 years. Yet I realize, and I'm sure you understand, that without Hanukkah, there would actually be no Christmas. But let me explain why. First, let's look at some of the similarities between Christmas and Hanukkah. The similarities include the theme of light. All Christian and Jewish homes are lit up. The giving of gifts, we give gifts. Eight on Hanukkah, one on Christmas, which is why I like to celebrate both. That makes nine. The gathering of families and the celebration of God as deliverer of his people. It's all part of Hanukkah and Christmas. Yet the differences between the holidays are pretty big also. Christians, of course, think about the incarnation, God becoming man, more on Christmas than at any other time of the year. Although we know that the incarnation is an ever-present truth. Jesus is what it's all about. God became a man. He took on flesh. He endured our pains, our sorrows, our hardship. He knows everything that we go through, and he died for our sins, and then crushed death, rose victoriously from the grave. What's most surprising for me, though, and unknown to most of my Jewish family and friends, is that the only mention of Hanukkah in the Bible is actually in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. That's shocking to Jewish people. In case you don't know already, Jewish people actually do not see the New Testament as God's word. I do, of course, as does all of our staff, but that's not a typical Jewish view. It's actually one of the greatest difficulties we have in sharing the gospel with Jewish people. I still remember the day that I realized Jesus was the Messiah. It happened after I read the New Testament and understood that Jesus was Jewish. Can you imagine that? I grew up in a Jewish home in New York City. I had no clue that he was Jewish until I read the New Testament and saw that he celebrated the Jewish holidays, including Hanukkah. As I continued reading the New Testament, especially the Gospels, it seemed to me that it was just a, a continuation of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, or what we call the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, we read about God's promises to the Jewish people and to the nations of the world. Then in the New Testament, we see how Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled these same promises. The Bible, both Old and New Testament, tells us one magnificent and seamless story of God's plan for redemption. God in the flesh. I deeply appreciate the story of Scripture, and it made perfect sense to me. Even more importantly, I just fell in love with Jesus. I believed he was indeed God wrapped in human flesh. Yet accepting his deity is typically very difficult for most Jewish people because we're raised to believe that God cannot have a physical form. Jewish people believe the Messiah will be a religious, political, and even military leader, but not God in the flesh. Jewish people affirm the first two commandments. We should have no other gods before us and no created graven images. These are the reasons why the idea of the incarnation is unacceptable to Jewish people. This difference between the faiths intensifies during the Christmas Hanukkah season, as it's difficult for Jewish people to avoid the issue, particularly in America, of Jesus' deity. Every public manger scene reminds us that the majority of people in the United States believe that God became a man. Whether they do anything about it or really believe it is another story. Jewish people know we're not supposed to believe it. As believers, we know it's true because we know him and we believe the Bible is, is God's perfect word. In Micah 5, 2, we learn that a leader in Israel would be born in Bethlehem and that his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. That's quite a description. The evidence for the Messiahship of Jesus intensifies with every page of the Old Testament story. But Jewish people believe the exact opposite. This conflict over the deity of Jesus is at the heart and core of the Christmas Hanukkah controversy. <laughs> Just as it was a controversy in the first century, it is today. It was during the celebration of Hanukkah, actually, 
that Jesus made one of his clearest statements of his deity, and I believe it was totally intentional, against the background of the Maccabean story of victory over Antiochus Epiphanes. In order to understand that, we have to look at the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22, all the way through verse 39. But let me read verse 31 and following. You can tell what happened by the response. The Jews, and when the word Jews is used by John in a negative sense, uh, it is, he's really referring to those Jewish people who are against Jesus. And remember, Jesus is Jewish, his disciples is Jewish, and John is Jewish, so it can't be all Jews. In fact, in Judaism, in Jewish thinking, a lot of Jewish people believe that the Gospel of John is the most anti-Semitic of all Gospels. But that's not true. It really was a family battle between Jewish people who followed Jesus, and Jesus himself, of course, and those who didn't follow him. And so don't think that it was anti-Semitic. And so after Jesus said what he said in John chapter 10, the Jews who were against Jesus, if you don't mind me putting it that way, picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus responded to them. And he said, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jewish people against Jesus answered him and said, for a good work, we don't stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So Jesus answered them and he said, has it not been written in your own law? I said, you are God, small g. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the son of God. If I do not do the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, though you don't believe me, believe the works that I do, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And then John continues, therefore they were seeking again to seize him and he eluded their grasp. Have you ever wondered why the Jewish leaders reacted so strongly to Jesus' declaration? It seems to go far beyond some kind of theological agreement. It was so serious, they, they wanted to stone him. So what was in their minds and what was in the mind of Jesus when he said it the way he said it? It's impossible to understand the reaction of the Jewish leaders without knowing something about the background of Hanukkah. You need to understand Hanukkah to understand why Jesus said what he said, when he said it, and why the response was so strong. Now, the story of Hanukkah is, is not found in the Bible, but it appears in the books of the Maccabees, which is part of the Apocrypha. Jewish people view these books as historical documents, but not divinely inspired. You'll never find the Apocrypha in a Jewish Bible. It is, however, viewed as accurate Jewish history and worth reading. Let me summarize the details of the Hanukkah story. Antiochus Epiphanes was a Seleucid Greek, Syrian Greek, who was the son of Antiochus III and became the leader of a part of the Greek Empire which had been divided in four parts upon the death of Alexander the Great. Now, the Jewish people called Antiochus the madman because of his cruel and erratic behavior. He was also known as Epiphanes, which is a Greek term which means God is manifest. And Antiochus thought he was the incarnation of Zeus, the head of the pantheon. The madman Polytheus wanted to turn the Jews into good Greeks and periodically outlawed Jewish worship and practices. Antiochus sent his emissaries along with a portable statue of himself and demanded that the Jewish people bow down and worship him as a Greek god incarnate. But you see, faithful Jewish people can't stomach idolatry and they would never bow to the statue of Antiochus Epiphanes. In fact, the Jewish people who lived in a small town near the airport today, called Modein, rebelled under the leadership of Mattathias, a Levitical priest, who along with his son Yehuda, Judah, led a grassroots rebellion against the Syrian Greeks between 167 and 164 BCE, before the Common Era or before Christ. The Maccabees fought hard, and in 164 BC, they defeated the Greeks. They retook Jerusalem and the temple. 
but their joy quickly turned to horror when they discovered that Antiochus had sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. And so the Maccabees dismantled the holy altar and removed the stones which they believed to be beyond cleansing. According to one Maccabees, they piled the stones into a corner of the temple area where they would await the coming of a great prophet who would cleanse them and build a new altar. This was a tradition that was outlined in the book of Maccabees. Kanika celebrates the victory of faithfulness and dedication over idolatry and the pressure to worship false gods. More specifically, worshiping the image of a man who believed he was the incarnation of a false god, Zeus, the chief of the pantheon. Jewish spiritual loyalty was ingrained in the Jewish soul, defined by resistance to idolatry and refusing to worship the image of a man claiming to be God. I believe this loyalty to the very idea that incarnation was wrong, was a devilish strategy designed to turn the Jewish people away from the real incarnation that the prophets of Israel predicted. But who can blame the Jewish leaders for resisting what was, in their understanding, an idolatrous statement by Jesus when he declared his oneness with the Father in John chapter 10? The leaders were actually somewhat blinded by their religious loyalty and zeal. They couldn't recognize Jesus as the one who fulfilled the promises of Scripture about taking on flesh and dying for the sins of the Jewish people and the world as found in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, and Isaiah 53, and Micah 5, 2, and Isaiah 7, 14. You know, I can't blame my people for resisting idolatry, but actually the leaders of the Jewish people in at this time period, in the first century, observed enough of Jesus' power to heal and perform miracles and fulfill the prophecies of what God would do in the flesh. He opened the eyes of the blind. He fed multitudes miraculously, cast out demons, and fulfilled all of the messianic qualifications peppered through the Hebrew scriptures, especially Isaiah 35. My prayer is for both Jews and Gentiles who do not yet believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, the reason for the season, to recognize that he's the son of David and the savior of the world. May the Lord use us, your mission to the Jewish people in the days ahead to bring this life transforming message to the Jewish people. Thank you so much for your prayers and your generous support, your loyalty to the Lord and to chosen people. And I pray that your love for the Messiah will grow deeper as you reflect upon the miracle of the incarnation. He is Lord. He is God in flesh. He is our Messiah and he is the Savior and the coming King. That babe in Bethlehem is the coming Messianic and remember to pray for your mission to the Jewish people and for Jewish people. God bless you. And I pray you will have a joy-filled Merry Christmas.